help sound the alarm, so to speak, about journalism? What inspired you? Was it a person, an event, an outrage? Why did you make this film? I know you said you've been reading newspapers since you were seven years old. Right, well, newspapers are close to my heart. And um, when I heard about uh, what was happening in Denver and the Denver Rebellion, um, I, I kind of jumped into action. I mean, it was really um, three things about that event that drew me in. Um, one was, why would uh, a, a, an outfit try intentionally to get rid, of news, get rid of journalism, get rid of newspapers? The second was, they want to make money. How do you make money from a failing business? And the third was the fact that these journalists themselves, um, as one of them says at the beginning of the film, we don't usually you know, write about ourselves or our industry, but they sprung into action and they were, um, they were doing the work that, uh, you know, informing the rest of us what was going on. And if not for them informing us, uh, we wouldn't know about how these newspapers were being destroyed by this industry, the hedge fund industry. In fact, I was surprised at how many journalists you were able to get on camera criticizing their future bosses or their current bosses. How did you get them to trust you? Um, well, part of it was uh, just me getting to know them. Um, I didn't just jump in and start, uh, you know, start interviewing. I explained what I was doing. Um, they got familiar with my track record about my other films. I think they felt like they could trust me. But there was something else because um, a lot of those interviews took place, at least the ones concerning the Denver newsroom, the Denver Post newsroom, took place right after the, the Denver Rebellion. And they were, I mean, they were smoking hot. You know, they were angry, they were passionate, they had poured their hearts out on their sleeve, and some of them risked their jobs and in fact had already lost their jobs because of their outspokenness. So um, I think it was a confluence of facts that helped them trust me and throughout the whole, you know, this film took five, five and a half years um, from beginning to end. Um, it, it took a continual back and forth type of relationship between us so that they would continue to trust me and um, we could kind of work together. We were, you know, we were at least on the same page. Was there any retaliation? You know, I saw Dave Krieger uh, was fired, but then I saw some of the journalists are still working at the, the Denver Post. So do you know of any retaliation? You know, what happened after this film came out? Right. Um, the. The retaliation wasn't, I mean, for, for Dave Krieger, yes, he was fired and as I you know, put up on the screen, he didn't have union protection at the, uh, at the Daily Camera, at the Boulder Daily Camera, so he had no protection. Um, the Denver Post did have, was a union shop, as was the East Bay Times where Tom Peel uh, worked. So they really, all the global capital really would be treading on thin ground legally if they took action against these people. But as you saw, when they started writing about, you know, when um, Chuck Plunkett, which I didn't go at, into his history, he was the one who wrote the original editorial. But as he continued to write editorials, he wasn't threatened, but the editorials were censored. And at a certain point, he quit because he felt like his, his, you know, his work couldn't be done there anymore. Um, one interesting thing, people ask me, um, have, has the hedge fund gotten in touch with you? So, you know, well, first of all, during the filming, I tried to get in touch with them and met with the same kind of stonewalling that um, the other newscasters talked about. You know, they, we didn't, they didn't uh, respond to our inquiries. Um, the answer to, you know, did they, did they get upset about, have they gotten upset about this film? Literally, the answer is no. I haven't heard from them. But um, 
shortly after the film came out i guess it was about two months ago we showed the film in oakland and i got you know a certain amount of press coverage there and one of the writers referred to them as you know referred to all the global capital as a as a hedge fund and he got a note from all the global capital saying we are not a hedge fund we are an investment strategy something something nothing i mean it was kind of like what happened earlier in the film where they changed the name of digital first media to something more nondescript they've gotten so much bad press and have been so identified like with the senator chuck schumer saying this is a uh you know uh in um what was the phrase he used the industry destroy the destroying uh newspaper industry destroy all the global capital which destroys newspapers that they they're trying to turn around the narrative and any of those catchwords that portray them as doing this nefarious deeds they want to counter that even to the point of inventing new companies right to go into their dirty work and and rebranding themselves exactly rebranding themselves and now um since this film has been finished i read almost weekly that they're in um you know they're in hospitals they're in real estate they're in trailer home parks they're in uh prison health care um yeah prison health care um and there seems to be no end to the things that they're making money off of and there's been a lot of great work by journalists about these other industries that they literally are plundering for example like an ambulance service that is not a for-profit business but they cut costs so badly that you know somebody who is literally dying gets an ambulance and they don't have the right tools you know they don't have the right medicines because they cut costs you know to make the business more profitable right right and in places like for housing low interest low um <clears throat> Uh, you know, housing for low-income people. They've bought up, started buying up that industry as well as trailer parks. And they're as soon as they do that, they raise the rent. And now Julie Reynolds, who was kind of the star of this film, told me just last week that they buy up. Let's see if I can recall exactly what she told me. They buy up the liens of the people that that can't quite make their uh, mortgage payments every month. The old owners would give them some, you know, leeway to do that, some way that they could postpone a month or two months or something. Alden has been buying up those liens and then being strict about the, uh, the residents paying back. And if they don't, they take the lien and then they own the property and they can evict these people from their houses. So we have in our audience both journalism students and documentary production students. What were the biggest challenges making this from an editorial standpoint and then from a production standpoint? Hmm. The biggest challenge editorially was to both narrow down the story so that it wasn't all over the place. There's so much going on in journalism and I think at the beginning and through the middle of some of the editing, I was trying to cover so much in a sense, saving, you know, my mission was to save journalism all over myself, I don't know. Um, and so narrowing it down to the Alden story and the, the, um, the journalist fighting back helped me streamline it. And then I could build it out to some of these nonprofits, INN and um, you know, it, Institute for Nonprofit News, and the ideas of, um, of federal funding for taxpayer funding for journalism, what's the future going to be like, um, what you can do about things. So the narrowing down helped me then make it manageable so that it wasn't just narrowed to the hedge funds, because after all, the problems with journalism today have not been caused by hedge funds. It's been exacerbated by hedge funds. They've taken advantage of it, and it's not a trivial thing because they own over own a control over half the newspapers in this country. Um, 
So uh, that, uh, I think I've lost my train of thought, but I think I And, and then what about from the production side? I saw you were actually filming in a couple of the shots. Tell us about some of the challenges. You know, uh, do well, you see a feature length documentary like this? Yeah, well, I think one, actually one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest problems was getting access to the newsroom themselves. Just as we got involved in the, in the story, which was uh, about a month and a half after the Denver Rebellion, all the global capital understood that they were getting bad publicity. So as I approached the Denver Post, as I approached the East Bay Times for access to their newsroom, usually the local people were very sympathetic to doing that but they heard from corporate above that it's just not gonna happen. It's like, I got these phone calls that almost seemed like one after the other. Heather, sorry Rick, really like to help you out. Very sympathetic what you wanna do, but it's not gonna happen in this newsroom. So that was one of the challenges. Um, and we did eventually get inside the, the Denver Post. Uh, Without them knowing? Well, it wasn't so much without them knowing, I think without them caring, I think until they lost that battle in Gannett, which was a little bit later in, into the filming, they kind of felt like they were impervious, like any bad publicity, they didn't care about. They um, weren't responsible to the SEC, to the Security Exchange Commission, and they were pretty much above the law as, you know, some of the powerful people feel that way, especially in this country. Let's hear from the audience. Do you have any questions or comments? Hi, again, thank you for this film. I wanted to ask about, again, the idea of coverage of protest movements. Uh, we sing a great uh, rebellion in this film. And thinking about Atlanta right now, and thinking about how there's a group called Cox Media. The Cox Media Group, which controls the majority of Atlanta uh, journalism. And therefore, uh, groups who are fighting something called Cop City don't necessarily receive the best coverage. How do we deal with the media coverage of protest movements uh, considering a journalism environment which is oriented primarily toward profit? Thank you again. Uh, that's a great question, um, but I think the end of your question starts to answer the question, which is the for-profit media is going to be much harder to uh, to get what people who are activists feel is fair coverage. But there's, there are more and more news organizations that are, are a more that they would consider public service journalism. A lot of them are nonprofit. Some of them, are, you know, are based in ethnic communities or or come out of specific movements themselves. And that's really the best way to help control the the narrative and the media coverage, which is um, the when I was a young man, which was during the Vietnam War. There was a newscaster in, I think it was in California. And he says, if you don't like the news, make some of your own. And in a way, that encapsulizes what it is. By going out and protesting, by going out and doing um, uh, demonstrations, you are making some of your own news. And then to get it covered by the, the, the connections that you have, that are more community based, that's the way to get it out to the greater, you know, a greater audience. Manage keeping on track and not going into like 70 different rabbit holes. Because you probably could have made like five documentaries out of this one documentary. Um, Great question. The, the answer is I didn't avoid that trap. <laughs> I went into many rabbit holes. Uh, I mean, I say that partly in jest, but it, it, that was one of the challenges because the headlines, we, we kept um, a log, a spreadsheet of 
all the newspaper articles that came across our awareness and by the time we were finished we were somewhere between fifteen hundred and two thousand articles and a lot of them had to do with hedge funds and journalism but a lot of them had to do with other ways that journalism was failing or other new startups or you know something new out there and I felt like we had to read all those articles and at least consider what they were doing um, but at a certain point you feel like you what you have and what you've already collected tells the story and hey get down to work make it work for you one of the things that happened in 2022 was that Alden went after Lee Enterprises, which is one of the remaining public chains. Uh, they own the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, is probably their largest paper, and they operate in the Midwest. And I was tempted to cover that, but it was like, been there, done that. I mean, we've done that, you know, with. Denver Post and, the, and Gannett, and, and we were in the middle of doing that with the Tribune Company. So at a certain point, you just figure out, you've told the story, the story isn't ended, but your film needs to be ended. So you make the decision and you wrap it up.
understand that this is an important part of our democracy and i think we are at a turning point right a crossroads and whether we say democracy whether we say journalism excuse me is related to whether we say democracy as we know it i don't think it's hyperbole at all and just to add on in addition to not being able to find fact-based information corruption you know there are all power is not going to be held to account at the same level with half the journalists you know in the country fired walter you got a question uh how did you what did you do for funding for five years um well we we got some um philanthropy funding uh especially at the beginning of the project which got us off the ground um right around the time that covid hit it was a hit on everybody um it was the money started to dry up the newsroom opportunities started to dry up because um everything was shut down so that was kind of a um a lean period for us 20 uh end of 2020 21 22 we did some crowdfunding um we went back to some of our same donors the, the closer we got to the end the more we could show this you know we're on the verge of um but that was also uh, a real challenge because we had to cut back to bare bone staff so just like the journalists you know we were trying to do the work that should be done by many, we were doing it by few. Now I understand one of the interests these hedge funds have, or whatever they want to call themselves, is the fact that newspapers at one point, when they were powerful, bought their buildings and owned buildings. And a lot of the reason why they're connected to real estate is because uh, this happened in Cincinnati where I was, I'm from, and I worked for the Cincinnati Post at one time and they bought the building and uh, one of the first things they wanted out of that was to strip that building and sell it and turn it into condos or whatever else they did in downtown Cincinnati. Can you talk about that? Uh, you touched on it, but you didn't address it as much as I think could have been addressed. Okay, um, um, fair enough, because uh, yeah, we, we tried to uh, talk in shorthand a lot because we were trying to cover a lot. But yes, this um, that's absolutely true that newspapers uh, up until the end of the 20th century were very profitable um, enterprises. They employed a lot of people, as we tried to show in the little history lessons, um, and they were supported by the, the rich advertising. And so and they owned the pay the buildings because they had to have presses and the trucks and everything. Yeah. Well, they there were there were a number of reasons why they were in downtown prime real estate. They wanted to be close to the action and back in the you know, in the 20th century, literally being there um, and being across from City Hall and being there and, you know, you could hoof it over there. Um, that's what reporting was like in the 20th century. It was very much person to person. Um, and they had big newsrooms and they could afford downtown real estate. And beginning of the 21st century, the staffs shrunk the reasons for them to be downtown um, were, were not as important. And I think that's one of the geniuses of all the global capital, their people, understanding that they could turn a profit just by selling the real estate and firing the staff and everything after that was, was gravy. Um, I'll say one more thing of just about how newspapers Run, ran and run. I was reading newspapers when I was seven years old. Why? Because I was a sports fan. I was a, you know, I grew up in this area and I was a Yankees fan. And I could, um, as long as they weren't playing on the West Coast, I could open the newspaper every day in the morning and get the box score and, and what it was written about. And now um, they've moved the printing, almost every newspaper around has moved the printing press out of town and has shortened the, uh, or moved up the deadline. So the deadlines used to be 10, 11 o'clock, and then you'd read it in the paper the next day. And now those deadlines are more like five o'clock, six o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I can't get a sports score, even the next day's paper for the scores last night. 
so for me i personally miss not being able to open my newspaper in print and i confess that in the last three months i've canceled my actual print edition subscription to the san francisco chronicle and i live you know live in the bay area and um and the new york times except for the sunday edition of the times and i i get them both digitally but um i think it's a loss and that's probably another discussion but um there's there's something different for me in consuming the news than it, than it used to be um so just how you touched upon like the digital how you got your Well, I think the the, the 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 there's two questions. I don't know if you intended it so, but there's two questions really. One is what is the future of that thing that you hold in your hand and open up and and read at the breakfast table? And I think there, I think it's very likely that in five years, except for um, papers like the New York the national papers like the New York Times, and probably a handful of local papers who still have that connection to local um, merchants who can advertise in their papers. But everybody else in between, I think the papers are gonna go away. They, they just won't be out there anymore because uh, there's a lot of money that goes into print and to, into delivery. Um, but, the future of news organizations, I think, is is not only up in the air, but I think is exactly what's on the table for this. So rather than predicting what will happen in five years, I'd say that I hope that this film can be part of the answer to what happens to journalism over the next five or 10 years. And by that, I mean, trying to inform the conversation, trying to bring the conversation to the forefront rather than to the back of the bus, you know, where it probably stands now. There are people who are concerned with rebuilding or, you know, the loss of news. And, and it's great to see this, this uh, auditorium filled with those people, but it's still a small segment of the population and I hope to help make it a larger percentage of the population. Your film does explore several different models, like public funding, funding by philanthropy, crowdsourcing. Which do you think, you've spent a lot of time with this, is most promising to save local newspapers in particular? Yeah, I think that, that what's important, and it seems like people kind of in the business, like you saw a guy named Steve Waldman, rebuilt local news. Uh, Penelope Abernathy, who's been writing about this. And what a lot of those people who have been in this area longer than I have say that in every community is going to be a different solution. Um, and it's going to be, in part, particular to your community. Um, we're going to uh, Minneapolis with the film next month. They have a very, very strong local newspaper in the Star Tribune. They also have a, an old and old newspaper, the Pioneer Press in St. Paul. Um, so that's one of the rare, probably, venues where they've made it work. It's owned by a billionaire so, uh, that the Star Tribune I'm talking about. Um, so that might be part of their solution and not have to lean on maybe nonprofit models as much as another area, another city, or another small town. Um, the, the poor and the rural and um, tend to be folks around uh, papers in the, uh, you know, of the cities in the south and rural areas in the south. They don't have the philanthropic, um, they don't have the wealth often to build up their news organizations. And it's a much, much more serious problem there than in a place like New York or Baltimore or Minneapolis or Denver. Um, so I, I do think that we need much more talk about public funding. And again, I urge, urge you to 
just Google New York Sustain Journalism Sustainability Act, because I don't have the exact name, because that's coming up right now for your state. Um, and it gives uh, kind of tax incentives to local news organizations in a way that in a way that's positive, in a way that's positive. It's not gonna be the answer. Um, I do think that taxpayer money for journalism is in some way, shape, or form, and with safeguards, uh, part, part of the answer, and an important part of the answer, because it gets us back to the notion that everybody in this country without regard to ability to pay, deserves to hear about the news and opinion, and that the democracy is not gonna work without it, and to get it even partway back to the scale that it was in the last century is gonna take a lot of money, and the business model, there is no business model that will do that. It, it has to be considered, as one person says in the, in the film, a public service and not a commodity. Right, and there are good models. NPR, PBS, uh, publicly funded. You look at other countries, the BBC is publicly funded, yet they still are able to maintain their independence from Yeah, the absolutely, absolutely. And I think a lot of the fear of, oh, government, oh, we should be, oh, oh we don't want to be touched that. There, the, yeah, there are ways around it, not only in this country, as you just mentioned, but um, in most of the, um, I guess, first, we call them first world um, countries, uh, especially in Europe, Japan, there's a lot, a lot more public funding in virtually every one of those countries than we have in this country. And it is really changing the mindset that journalism is a public service, not necessarily a high profit business. That's right. Yeah. Um, go ahead, uh, back here. I'm just to kind of return on what you were talking about, about the different solutions to, you know, Google's news. Um, should that context of New York being so connected to finance is about philanthropy and journalism. I, I, I think, yeah. I think that philanthropy and journalism is part of the solution. I don't think it's the answer. I think that, I think for, for anything that's really important to us and our public life, I think relying on very, very, the very, very wealthy, whether it's their own pocketbooks or their foundations, um, I think there's, there's a problem with that. Uh, it makes people maybe less active themselves, and it's also, as you saw in the film, it doesn't work out so well all the time. So um, on, on the other hand, there is the MacArthur uh, Foundation last year announced a big initiative to put more money into journalism. I think that's a positive development, but like I said just a little bit, it's gonna be a, the answer's gonna be in a combination of efforts. And I think anyone who says this is the one answer is probably not being realistic. Even public funding in journalism because how do we get the country to move in that direction? I mean, you know, one, one fraction, one small, small fraction of what we put into the, what's called the defense budget the war budget um, could do a huge amount to getting adequate journalism for everybody in this country. It's a it's a question of political will and pro political priorities. Thank you. 
kind of self has for this world. I'll say this in the mild man way, um, cultural results um, and how that in itself affects democracy. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, you you brought up you mentioned your your journalism student yourself. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just did want to make a comment about that. I think in some way, you know, I've been doing films about journalism since I started, you know, I've been going, going back 30, 40 years. Um, I think there's a certain, I don't know what, if it's a gene, in a certain percentage of the population in any society that wants to make, makes that person want to find out what in the hell is going on because what I see behind me is not all that it seems, and I want to dig out the truth. And it's kind of fun digging out the truth. And I want to expose the lies and the deception. And that's true today no less than it was true 20, 30, 40 years ago when newspapers were more robust. So there's part of me that feels like this, that journalism gene, that DNA, is going to push through. And I just, I mean, I encourage any of you out here, don't give up your dreams. If that's where you're oriented, you're going to be the ones that figure it out on how to keep this journalism thing going in this country and benefit the rest of us. So, I, and, and I keep hearing from people who, who teach at journalism schools. There's no shortage of interest among um, people of your cohort. And one last question, Ju, go ahead. Uh, great, Boris. Um, it could be a little off topic though. So I'm interested in movies and a uh, documentary, of course, but I know the different, I understand the characteristics of uh, between movies and documentary, but I just want to know your like, choice of that. It could be like, you know, you could do Don or like movies. It has to Uh, when I first got into filmmaking, um, which was in the uh, early 1980s, um, I first did a, a documentary. It was 15 minutes. It was on mural painting in my community. I somehow felt like I, I loved the medium, and I loved and and actually my um, my my I biggest influences were Hollywood films, dramatic films, Alfred Hitchcock. Um, you know, back back in those days, people like Barry Levinson and, and uh, Costa Gavras, these names might not mean anything to you. Um, but I also felt like my voice was better suited to the documentary form. And I felt like, when I say I was influenced by those other directors, they, they helped me figure out this thing called storytelling. And the documentary part of it was more the um, the events, the real life events, and looking into not only those events and those people, but why those people who were maybe involved in social issues, what drove them? What drove um, them to take action? What drove them to go in a certain direction? What told them to risk this or risk that. And it just, I sometimes maybe had the opportunity to switch to fiction film, but it was never a strong enough pull for me to veer from the documentary path. And storytelling is so powerful for journalism also, right? So just to close it out, uh, what can our students in the audience do to support journalism? You mentioned the legislation, but beyond that, what should we be doing in our daily lives to support journalism? Well, I, I think that um, I, I said some of this before. It's becoming aware of the issues, becoming aware of the issue more of what's happening to journalism, but really informing yourself on everything that happens around you. And I think that with the advent, um, with the advent of cell phones and with the advent of like um, Apple News and, and that sort of thing, 
there's a tendency to to use that as shorthand for informing ourselves to ourselves ourselves about the world around us and i think there's really no substitute for real local journalism people that you know in your community who are working on your local paper or local nonprofit or local public radio station and learning about the world that way getting together with journalists of uh, journalists in your own community um, mixing it up and taking it seriously that what the the moment that we're in right now is is a turning point I realize I'm, I'm uh, repeating myself, but I think that that's the only answer is for enough people to take journalism itself seriously enough and to know that we're all connected to the communities around us. So we owe it to ourselves to do the work to find out what's going on outside our, um, our, our person, personal world. And, and students, remember, you can subscribe for free right now to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, as CUNY students, and uh, support journalism, local journalis journalism, uh, by uh, buying a subscription or making a donation during the NPR drive. Right? You can support in your own way um, journalism. Yeah, absolutely. In the Bay Area, we have two public radio stations and a listener-sponsored radio station, the last being KPFA and the others being KLW and, and, um, and KQD. And I subscribe to all, and I listen to them all. And to me, those radio stations are high on my list on how I stay connected to the local issues of the day in my area. Rick, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>